Gethsemane and the interrogation of Jesus. Outside Jerusalem, in sight of the temple complex, is the mile-long ridge known as the Mount of Olives. There was a place there called Gethsemane, which means oil press. John tells us that there was a garden called Gethsemane, and obviously it would have had olive trees like these. They say that some of the olive trees on the Mount of Olives today are as old as 1,500 years old. When we see Jesus at Gethsemane, it's night time. He and his disciples have left from the Last Supper, and Jesus is about to pray. About what's about to he takes his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John, apart from the rest, and wants them near. As he's going to step aside from them and pray, he wants them to wait, watch with him. The text says, he told them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He withdraws a little and he kneels to pray a first time. Father, if you are willing Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. We learn from Luke's account that angels come to strengthen him, and that as he's praying, his sweat is dropping like blood. So much does he realize the agony he's about to endure that he tells the Father he would rather not do it, but submits himself still to God's will. So he goes to check on his close friends. They're asleep. Now Luke tells us that they are asleep from sorrow. They are finally realizing how terrible things will be. And if they wait for Jesus, they just fall asleep. And so the Lord admonishes them and speaks to Peter, could you watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you don't fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And so Jesus returns and prays even more submissively. Now, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, May your will be done. He finds the disciples asleep again. This time he lets them sleep. And he prays a third time. That the Father's will be done. And then. He comes and he wakes up his disciples. And he gives them the warning. The hour is near. The Son of Man is betrayed. Into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus 
then allows Judas to turn him in to his enemy. Judas leads some soldiers and some officials to get some in. He needs a place. They come with torches and lanterns and weapons, and Judas has told them to arrest the one that he greets with a kiss. And that's exactly what Judas does. He walks towards Jesus and says, Rabbi! And he reaches to kiss him. And Jesus asks him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man? with the kid. And he does. Judas identifies him with the kid. And Jesus says, friend, do what you came for. So he gives himself up for arrest. He knows what's going to happen. And he says, who do you want when they, the arresting party, say, Jesus of Nazareth, he replies, I am he. They're so stunned that he would turn himself in that way. They draw back and they fall to the ground. And Jesus asks again, who is it you want? And when they reply, Jesus says, I told you that I am he. Let these men go. The soldiers the officials grab Jesus. They arrest him. The disciples ask if they should resist with swords. Peter goes ahead and draws a sword. And he cuts off the ear of a serpent of the priest named Malchus. Jesus makes Peter put the sword away. This is those who fight with the sword will perish by the sword. And Jesus heals the man's ear. He does turn himself in, but not without saying something. He says, I'm not a rebel that you need to come get with swords and clubs. Never laid a hand on me when I was in the temple. But this is your hour when darkness rules. So he allows them to arrest him and tie him up. And then briefly but significantly the text says all the disciples run away. They carry Jesus away for interrogation by religious authorities. John's Gospel tells us that first he faces Annas and then the high priest. Annas is the influential former high priest. And Caiaphas is the reigning high priest, who happens to be the son-in-law of Anna. Then it says that the high priest, some people find it confusing whether this is Anna or Caiaphas actually talking. The high priest asked Jesus about his teaching and about his disciples. Jesus says, I taught out in public. I, I didn't do any of this secretly. You can ask the people about my teaching. At that point, the interrogation turns abusive. There is some official there who hits Jesus in the face. Says, how dare you answer the high priest that way? Well, Jesus has something to say about that. He says, if I did something wrong, bear witness of what I did wrong. Why don't you hit me if what I said was right? We're told that when Anna 
turned Jesus over to the high priest. He was bound. He was tied up. Depending on the sequence of events, this may be that Jesus was standing there tied up when they hit him in the face. It's more complicated than you might realize. But the way the four Gospels structure this part of the story, Peter is now doing what the Lord said. He's denying the Lord. And it'll happen three times, as the Lord said. The denial is interspersed. It's like a a movie that changes scenes the two things going on at the same time between what's going on with Jesus and what's going on with Peter. We're going to look at Peter's denials uh, all together. And what we need to understand is that at the same time these terrible things are happening to Jesus. Another disciple, this is one of those times when we believe the Apostle John in his Gospel refers to himself modestly as another disciple. Near somebody who could get them in to the courtyard of the high priest. The high priest evidently had a palace, and perhaps since it had been kept in the family for some time, the Romans seemed to appoint people related to Anna as high priest. Perhaps a complex with a, a courtyard. And waiting in that courtyard, following at a distance, are Peter and John. While Jesus is being abusively interrogated, there's a servant girl at the gate who says to Peter, You were with Jesus the Galilean. You're not one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter says, I don't understand what you mean. And, well, I don't know him. And, I'm not one of his disciples. He denied the Lord the first time. Still, at a short distance away, Jesus is still being mistreated and interrogated. And a servant comes up, there must have been a lot of talk about who this is, and a bystander, and they say, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. This man is one of them. And again, the question, you're not one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter denies it. This one of men, I don't know him. I'm not one of his disciples. The second denies. Jesus is still being interrogated, mistreated by different authorities. And now the bystanders are saying, you certainly are one of them. Your accent gives you away. And they say, certainly, this man also was with them. Look, he's a Galilean too. And a servant, actually a relative of Malchus, whose ear was cut off, says, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Peter curses, swears. I don't know the man. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, no, I wasn't in the garden. Now he's denied the Lord. Three times. And then, as Jesus said, rooster crow. Peter remembers what Jesus had said. He goes out, weeps bitterly, breaks down, cries. Exactly when the rooster crows, Jesus is in a position where he and Peter can see each other. And Luke tells us that Jesus turns from his interrogators and looks at Peter. And that's when he remembers what he said and he went out 
and wept so bitterly. Jesus faces not only the high priest and his father in law, the former high priest, he faces the entire Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. They're looking for people who can give testimony to some made up charges. Their goal is to kill Jesus. They get a couple of people who say that Jesus threatened to destroy the temple. They misquote him about uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again, which he was talking about his resurrection. Jesus doesn't say anything when they lie about him that way. The high priest says, well, aren't you going to say anything? Listen to everything they're charging you with. And then he says something extremely important. The high priest says, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus replies, you've said so. He says, if I tell you, you won't believe. If I ask you, you won't answer. But he does add, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming from the clouds of heaven. The high priest shows his outrage by ripping his robes. And he declares the accusation, you're guilty of blasphemy. He tells the Sanhedrin, we don't need any more witnesses. You all have heard the blasphemy. What do you say? And the Sanhedrin condemns him. Blasphemy. He's worthy of death. The text tells us once they pronounce that condemnation, the guards start mocking Jesus. They beat him. They blindfold him and say, Prophesy the Christ. Who is that who hits you? That's an interrogation by the religious authority. When Judas hears that they've condemned him to death, he's sorry. You know, the officials had paid him 30 pieces of silver. He tries to return them. He says, I've sinned betraying innocent blood. They say, we don't care. That's your problem. And he just throws the money on the floor. And then, he goes out and hangs himself. The hypocrisy of the priest involved in that payoff really shine. Their hypocrisy shine. They say, well, it'd be wrong to put this money in the treasury. It's blood money. Blood money they pay. But they're concerned about this. They can't put it in the treasury, so they buy a field that a potter owns, and it's used as a cemetery for outsiders. But the text tells us everybody knows how they pay for that, and they call it the field of blood which, buying the potter's field, fulfills the prophecy. Back in Zechariah chapter 11. Next, Jesus faces the Roman governor, Pilate. You see there his name on the bottom right on a stone that's been found in modern times. Jesus faces Pilate. At one point in the 
interrogation of Jesus by Pilate. Pilate tries to show the crowd that he has punished this man enough. And he drags out the beaten, mistreated Jesus, shows him to the crowd and says, Behold the man. That's what we're going to do now. Behold the man. The Jewish authorities deliver Jesus to the Roman governor. They tell Pilate that Jesus is subverting Israel, that he opposes Caesar's taxes, that he claims to be Christ, which means he claims to be a king. Pilate wants to brush it off. Sounds like a problem that you should deal with yourself, this is his attitude. But these Jewish authorities insist you have to take the case, Pilate, because as the government set up now, only the Romans can give a death penalty. By our law, blasphemy is a death penalty offense. John reminds us this is the fulfillment of the prediction of Jesus that he became goes over to the Gentiles. Pilate discusses it with Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, are you asking for yourself or because people told you that? Pilate says, well, your people, your priests accuse you. What have you done? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, or my people would fight. Pilate replies, so, so you are a king. Jesus he said it. I was born to be king and to testify to the truth. At this point, Pilate makes the famous reply, What is truth? But the text tells us that Pilate decides that Jesus is not guilty. But he says to Jesus, Why don't you answer your accusers? He's amazed that Jesus just remains silent. Pilate sees an opportunity to get this case off his docket. He's aware that Herod is in town for the Passover. And he sends Jesus to Herod. There, Jewish authorities argue against Pilate's acquittal. They say that Jesus has stirred up crowds from Galilee to Judea. And that's what makes Pilate take the chance to change the jurisdiction. This is Herod Antipas, who is Tetrarch of Galilee, and because they say it started in Galilee, that's the opportunity for Pilate to hand over the case to someone else. Herod is there for uh, Passover. That interrogation is a mockery of Jesus. Herod thinks he'd like to see a miracle. He questions Jesus. But Jesus says, uh, given the satisfaction of an answer. The Jewish leaders heatedly accuse Jesus to King Herod. And then Herod and his soldiers humiliate him, gather around him, ridicule him, mock him, dress him in a royal robe and send him that way back to Pilate. Ironically, 
Terry the pilot who had been enemies become friends in this ugly abuse of justice. Interrogation is back to the pilot. He announces that both he and Herod have rejected the charges against Jesus. And that Jesus is guilty of nothing worthy of death. So Pilate says he'll just punish Jesus and release him. So as Pilate offers the release, the crowd is aware that he always releases a prisoner at Passover. And so Pilate says, do you want the king of the Jews or Barabbas? Now, we're told that Pilate does this because he knows that it's all about jealousy. That envy led the chief priest to deliver Jesus to him. And we're also told, as an aside, that at this time Pilate's wife sends word of a dream that she had that warned that Jesus is in it. So Pilate wants to avoid executing Jesus. So he offers them this insurrectionist murderer of Barabbas. So the chief priests stir up the crowd and convince them to ask for Barabbas. And that's what they yell, give us Barabbas! Pilate still doesn't want to kill Jesus. So he says, well, what do you want me to do with Jesus? They say, crucify him. Pilate responds, he doesn't deserve death. I says, we need to punish him and release him. And the crowd says, crucify him, crucify him. At this point, Pilate has Jesus scourged, flogged, flagellated. That's where they take Jesus, rip his robe off, tie him to a post, and beat him with a horrible whip that has sharp objects in it, metal, bone, pieces of glass. And they beat us back into a bloody pulp. A process that sometimes actually kills some men. In that condition, the soldiers mock Jesus. The whole battalion surrounds him, strips him, puts that royal robe back on him, makes a crown, but they make it out of thorn, give him a sick breath staff. And they kneel and they mock and they say, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him. He sees his head with that staff. And it is in that condition that Pilate puts this humiliated Jesus Christ on display. And he says again, I don't find any basis for your charges. And that's when he says, Behold the man. So the leaders again in the crowd cry out, Crucify! Crucify! And Pilate objects again, Crucify him yourself! I don't find him guilty. They said he claimed to be God's son. He deserves to die for such. Pilate questions Jesus one last time. Pilate's afraid. He had these premonition warnings. He says to Jesus, where do you come from? Jesus doesn't answer. So Pilate says, don't you know I have the power to free you or crucify you? And Jesus does reply. You only have power because it's given from above. 
And actually, my accusers are more guilty than you are. So Pilate appeals to the crowd one more time. But he gets in. And they challenge his loyalty to Caesar. They say, if you let this man go, you're not a friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And so, Pilate brings Jesus to the judgment seat at a place called the pavement. Pilate says, here is your king. And the crowd says, take him away. Crucify him. Pilate's reply is, shall I crucify your king? And the priests say, we have no king but Caesar. And then, famously, Pilate washes his hands of guilt. He sees that he's getting nowhere, that there's an uproar in his building. And so he has somebody bring out a bowl of water, and he washes his hands in front of the crowd. He says, I'm innocent of the blood of Jesus. This is your responsibility. And the crowd says, let his blood be on us and our children. And so Pilate gives the people their demand. He releases Barabbas. And he surrenders Jesus to their will. He hands Jesus over to be crucified. As you know, the story almost ends with the crucifixion. It turns around and it ends with the resurrection. Crucifixion was a torture that the Romans saved as punishment for the worst criminals or punishment to make a point that you don't challenge the Roman Empire. Crucifixion was humiliating. It was a long death. The victims to be executed were tied to a post sometimes with a cross thing as we're accustomed to. In Jesus' case, hands and feet are nailed perhaps so that he can't use them. A person on a cross is left to die eventually by suffocation. Their legs are bent. But as their body hangs from that position, it's hard to breathe. The body pulls against the lungs. And so the victim pushes up to try to get a breath, can't stand the pain, and drops down, suffers for breath again, and does that over and over until he just can't breathe anymore. When the crowd said, crucify him, that's what they were asking. The Pilate has given in. He condemned him to crucifixion. And so Jesus begins to walk through the way of the cross. Soldiers put his own clothes back on him, lead him out to crucify him. He's to carry his own cross as he goes out, and he does so until it falls. Remember, he had been beaten within an inch of his life. And so they force a man who just happened to be there from North Africa, Simon of Cyrene, has to carry the cross. 
and the execution process begins. Not just Jesus there. Jesus and two robbers are led to their deaths. They come to Golgotha, the place of the skull. They offer Jesus wine with myrrh, perhaps an anesthetic, but he refuses. Nine o'clock in the morning, they nail him to the cross. And as they do that, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then as prophesied, these soldiers who think they're just doing their job are gambling for who gets his clothes. Pilate has had a sign put on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth. The king of the Jews, he wanted everybody to read it because he had it written in Aramaic, the language they spoke every day, in Latin, the language of the empire, in Greek, the language of the eastern part of the empire. The chief priest wanted that changed to just, he claimed to be king of the Jews. But Pilate seems to be making a point. His answer is, what I have written, I have written. Torture is bad enough, but people mock Jesus as he's tortured on the cross. Crowds have come out. They shout at him, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. The cry out, he saved himself, but he can't, he saved others, but he can't save himself. King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe him. Oh, he trusts in God, let God rescue him. He said he was his son. And even those closest up to Jesus mock him on the cross. The soldiers mock him. They offer him sour vinegar to drink. And they say, King of the Jews, save yourself. And even one of the criminals crucified next to him insults him. Oh yeah, you're the Christ? Well then save yourself and us. The second criminal speaks up. He says to the brazen criminal, Don't you fear God? This man hasn't done anything wrong. We, we're being punished for what we did, but he's done nothing wrong. And then he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, Today, you will be with me in paradise. John recounts one of the most moving, upsetting scenes of the cross. Jesus looks down from that cross and he sees his mother standing nearby with John. He says to his mother, woman, Here's your son. He says to John, here's your mother. In other words, with all that he was experiencing, he looked down and he said to his best friend, take care of my mama. And so John takes Mary into his home from then on. Everything went dark from noon to pray in the afternoon. Jesus cries out in their language, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoted from the song. 
Well, people just hear the first couple of words, Elo, Elo, and they say, Oh, he's calling for Elijah. Then in somber tones, Matthew tells us that he knew it was all finished. He said, I'm thirsty. And they gave him some of that wine and vinegar to drink. While some in the crowd were saying, Oh, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes safe. And then Jesus said, It's finished. Father, to your hands I commit my spirit. He bows his head and gives up his life. He dies. The disciples who are going to bury him. But at the time of the death, miraculous signs occur. Inside the inner sanctuary of the temple, a great curtain, think of it like a stage curtain, separated the most holy place from the holy place, and that curtain was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split, tombs were open, and out of those tombs, holy people who had long been dead rose and appeared to many people. There was a centurion at the crucifixion who declared he was the Son of God. This Jesus has died. There are people still at the cross who are grieving. There are these women, a small group of women who had accompanied Jesus throughout his ministry who are still there. The witnesses are now just beating their breast and going away. The Jewish leaders don't want crosses up outside Jerusalem on the Sabbath with dead bodies on them. And so they make that known to the governor. And the soldiers go out want to make sure that they're dead. So they break the legs of the two others crucified so they can't push up to breathe anymore. It looks like Jesus is already dead, and they're not going to break any bones. They just stick a spear up his side. Blood and fluids pour out. As John records that sad event, he says, And I saw that. Scriptures have said not a bone would be broken, but I saw what they did to him. There are two members of the Sanhedrin that we know were believers in Jesus. And they make arrangements for the burial. Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and gets permission to take the body and bury it. John tells us that Nicodemus, you will remember him from two occasions earlier in the Gospel, Joseph and Nicodemus wrapped the body as is customary. And then Joseph places the body in his own newly cut stone tomb. Probably cut out of a, a wall into the rock. Probably something that someone could walk in and platform on which the body would be placed. He has a large stone rolled over the entrance to the tomb to close it off. We're told that these women from Galilee who had been accompanying Jesus observed the burial. And now it's Sabbath, and there would not be any work on the Sabbath, but when the Sabbath is over, they're preparing the spices to bring care of the other.
The Pharisees want to make sure that nothing untoward happens at the grave site. So they asked Pilate to secure that tomb for three days. They said, you know, he said he would rise in three days. And we think the disciples are going to go take the body and claim that he was raised from the dead. So Pilate authorized it, putting a seal on the tomb, posting guards there. But God intervened. An angel arrives with an earthquake. The angel rolls away the stone and just stun it. He says the guards just shake and become like dead men, they think. Sunrise on Sunday. Sabbath is over. The women are going to anoint the body. They get there and they're, they're shocked that the stone has been rolled away. They look into the tomb, they go in, and there's an angel there. They're frightened. The angel calms them down and explains, You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. He's ahead up. He's going to Galilee. You'll see him there, just like he does. When the women leave in stunned silence, they, they remember what Jesus said. They're running out of the tomb. They're trembling. They're afraid. They don't tell anybody as they leave. But the angel is there. Among those women was Mary Magdalene. She tells Peter and John. So they run to the tomb. John gets there first and looks in and he's just grave clothes and all the body. But Peter pushes on in. And he sees that the face cloth has been rolled up separate. John comes into the tomb and he believes. So they go home. Evidently, Mary Magdalene has stayed behind at the great sun. She's crying outside the tomb. She looks in. And she sees angels where Jesus lay. And they say, why are you crying? Mary must be very confused. She says she's upset because she doesn't know where they put him. Now Jesus is standing behind her, but in her crying, she doesn't recognize who that is. She hears someone say, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thinks maybe it's the gardener, and she says, if you carry him away, tell me where. And I'll get him. And so Jesus calls her by name. She recognizes him. She cries out, Rabboni, teacher. But then she grabs a hold of him and he says, Stop clinging. Go. Tell the others that I am returning to my father. He appears to the other women as well. They're afraid and full of joy, and they run, and they tell the disciples. Jesus appears, greets the women. They fall down and worship him. He calms them down, and he says, You go tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. The disciples are together, talking, and Jesus appears. Peace be with you, he says. And they think it's a ghost. He says, come on. Look, my hand, see, touch, see where the nails were. And they're just so happy and amazed, they can't believe it. So he says something like, you got anything to eat? He gives them a dish to eat, and he, he eats in front of them. And he tells them, what you see here, is the fulfillment of all that's written in Moses, in prophets, in the Psalms, that is, in the Hebrew Scriptures. He blesses his disciples there and gives them a mission. He sends them out. Peace be with you, he says. 
As the Father sent me, so I send you. And he breathes on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. One of the apostles wasn't there at this time, Thomas. When the disciples say, we've seen the Lord, it's a week later, he didn't believe them. Then, a week later, Jesus appears. He says, I want you to feel my hand, the imprints of the nails, and feel my side where the spear was. Thomas is condemned. He says, My Lord and my God. And Jesus says that's a blessing, but it's a blessing to those who believe without ever seeing. The 21st chapter of John gives an additional account. Life seems to have gone on. The disciples who fish are out at their business fishing. Jesus calls from the shore. They don't know who it is. And he says, put the net on the right side of the boat. They, can't, they catch so many fish, they, they can't pull them all in. Jesus is preparing breakfast. And he has breakfast with his disciples. Peter sees who it is. He jumps in the water. He swims in. The rest come in. They find that fish cooking over a fire. And they found some bread. And Jesus says, bring some of those fish over here. And it tells us in a very interesting, obviously first-hand detail. There are 153 fish. This is the third time he's appeared to them since the resurrection. There are other accounts of Jesus commissioning his disciples to spread the gospel, the Great Commission. Matthew 28 tells us about a time he met with the eleven, remember Judas has died, on a mountain in Galilee. He tells them to go spread the gospel. He promises to always be with them. And he words it in the terms going out into the world, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded. Mark 16 seems to be a repetition of that commission. This time it's worded, going into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. With the explanation that those who believe and are baptized will be saved. The promise is made that miracles will come to believers, confirming that this is God's word. Luke tells us about back in Jerusalem when he again explains their mission. He explains the scriptures that have foretold his suffering and his resurrection. He tells them that their mission will be preaching repentance to all nations. And he calls them witnesses of these things. And then, not in the Gospels, but in the book of Acts, in the first chapter, we see Jesus instructing his apostles again, just before he ascends, rises into heaven. He comes to them, waiting in Jerusalem one last time. He promises them power when the Holy Spirit comes on them. And he sends them as witnesses from Jerusalem throughout the world. And then they see Jesus lifted up, then hidden by the clouds, ascending to heaven. And angels say, why do you stand there staring? He's going to come back in the very same way. And they returned joyfully from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem to begin his work. 
What is the point of it all? John wraps up the story twice. At the end of the 20th chapter, John tells us, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In the 21st chapter, he closes saying, This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things, and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. John is affirming that he is an eyewitness. Now there were also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose, that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. The point of the gospel is revealed in John chapter 20. These are written so that you may believe. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. These are written so that by believing that, you may have life in his name.